Chapter 15, <clears throat> as we dig in with more application from Paul uh, for the church body, uh, for a church that he hadn't visited yet, uh, he was going to see them, but he hadn't been there yet. But he's in this place just writing to them and just a, a great letter of doctrine, of encouragement, of strengthening, uh, one of exhortation and comfort. Uh, in just confirming them, just confirming them in the faith, uh, which is just what the church is supposed to do, especially you look at Thessalonians, and, and that was the whole purpose, was just to to do those things, to exhort, to comfort, uh, to confirm them, uh, which is what a, a church body ought to be doing, and certainly that was happening uh, for them and happens for us too as we go through. Uh, but he starts out and he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. We ought to carry the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Uh, it's interesting that the, the world has this so backwards. Uh, they think the strong ones are, are the, uh, the legalists, the ones that are going forward and everything. Uh, but really, uh, the, the strong ones have more liberty not to have to do that. It's those that are weaker in their faith that are more legalistic about their ways and legalistic about their their motives and in the way that they go about things. Uh, but the church is always backwards from that. God's ways are always different than our ways. Uh, and he says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities, ought to carry them along uh, and be with them, uh, to notice them. Uh, and uh, so much of the church doesn't do that. We, we don't notice the infirmities. We don't notice the weaknesses because uh, we want to see the strengths, and, and we always go for the strengths and, and how to promote them, how to push them, how to move them along. And yet God always wants us to go and, and to notice those things that are weak so that we can stand alongside, uh, which is what Jesus did with the disciples. Uh, whenever they were weak, he always came alongside uh, and ministered to them and showed them the right way to go. Uh, and certainly for us, that's that's what we ought to be doing is the stronger we get in the things of the Lord, the stronger that we come alongside of folks, the, the better it is for them, the better it is for us. It just is an encouragement all the way through. Even in Galatians in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren... So again, talking to the church, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. So again, coming alongside those that are weak, coming alongside those that have fallen, coming alongside those that are, are just unable to do what they need to do at the moment. He says, you, you come alongside and you restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, not lauding it over them that we're better but we come alongside with the same heart, realizing that we can fall just as quickly as anybody else. We, we can enter into those places just as well as anybody else. We restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest also you be tempted. <laughs> uh, and certainly, when we think we've got something together, we know the enemy's going to be right there. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Let me show you what you really are. Uh, <laughs> so Paul goes on then and he says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Uh, uh, and we see that uh, way back in Genesis. We, we see that with Abraham. Uh, we've been through it on Sunday mornings, but it's always good to be reminded of those things. Uh, but uh, Paul says, Let every one of us please his neighbor or help his neighbor for his good. Notice not for our good. Uh, we, we don't want to come alongside with an angle that, that we can get something out of this. We come alongside just to encourage others and just to strengthen others. Uh, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good uh, to edification. So we're supposed to be edifying all the way through. And in chapter 13 of Genesis, we see Abraham here. Uh, and he's in that place with Lot. Uh, they, they've come to the land. Uh, Abraham worshiping. Uh, he goes up to Bethel uh, and, and he worships. He builds an altar there again. Lot also goes up with his flocks and herds, but doesn't build an altar, doesn't do any of those things. 
Uh, and it says in verse 7 of chapter 13 that there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. So the stronger comes alongside of the weaker and says, This is the way it's supposed to be. Let, let's, let's break these things down so that we, we don't have strife in the midst of it. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and your herdmen. So he, he looked and he saw the herdmen, but he realized where it was coming from. It was coming from Lot because Lot was the one bringing it in, the divisiveness. And he was coming alongside of him so that the herdmen would then come alongside of each other too. And he says, because we're brethren, we're brothers in the Lord. <laughs> Even though Lot wasn't looking like it, uh, Abraham realized that he was a brother. And sometimes we don't look like brothers and sisters in the Lord to other people. <laughs> we have those attitudes. We have those hearts. We have those ways that just show others that, boy, I wonder if they're even saved. <laughs> but but the Lord knows who's saved. And he tells Abraham, come alongside this man. Encourage him. Strengthen him. Bring him to that place of seeing. And he says, is not the whole land before thee? So separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you depart from the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw what he wanted, not what was right, but the direction that was going to be wrong for him. It was going to be a wrong direction. Uh, but Abraham, the elder, the patriarch, the one who had authority, the one who was able to take whatever he wanted and had every right to do so according to the culture of the land, instead humbles himself and says, Lot, you go and take whatever you want, and I'll just take what's left over because I'll be content no matter what I take. No matter what part comes to me, I'm going to be content. And, and boy, that shows strength of character, strength of faith, strength of, of nature. Uh, that Lot didn't have because Lot couldn't do that. And so Abraham had to. And shouldn't we be the ones as we grow in the things of the Lord to be able to do those things as we come to our brothers and sisters just to be able to say, you take what you want. I'll be content no matter which direction you go. I'll be content. I'll be the strong one in this. But I, I just want to come alongside of you and help and sustain you in the midst of that. And, and boy, we all enter into those places. Uh, I know at the funeral, and thank you again for your prayers for the funeral. Uh, we got the message out. <laughs> uh, hopefully we got the message out. But uh, it's so wonderful when you look out and you see believers that are there. Because uh, as soon as I started, because my voice started shaking, I know it did, because uh, the tears were coming, uh, I saw heads going down. And people started praying right away. It was just like, thank you. <laughs> Boy, do I need that. Uh, and you know that, that when you're weak, that others are there to hold you up and to strengthen you. Because you know who's interceding for you daily. Jesus. He intercedes for us every day. He knows when we're becoming weak. And he knows how to strengthen us. But it, it's nice when we enter into those places that the Lord enters into, that, that we get the heart of the Lord in the midst of that. And that is so sweet that we can have his heart and pray the same way that he does and ask the Lord for those things the same way he does. And that's where we want to go to. We want we don't want to stay the same way that we are. We want to grow. We want to mature. We want to be those strong Christians that, that can act like it and just be in that place for others. And so he says, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, not so that we can get something out of it, what we get out of it. And I tell you, you get more blessed by being a blessing than you do by receiving the blessing. I really believe that. You know, it's nice. Isn't it nice as adults on Christmas when you see the kids and the grandkids opening presents? You just get blessed by seeing them so happy. I mean, you're sitting there taking 3,000 pictures with your phones. You never used to be able to do that with the old things. You know, you have to change the film, and you have to go into a dark place. And now you can take 3,000 pictures without even going anywhere, and it's all about the kids. We get more blessed by that than we do opening our own presents. 
I don't need a present. I just need to see you happy. I just need to see you blessed. And that's what the Lord is. He's so blessed by us as we grow in the things of the Lord to see mature believers who get more blessed by giving than they do by receiving. And our prayers change as we do that too, don't they? We no longer have our shopping lists as we mature in the things of the Lord of the things that we want, of the things that we need to have. It's more for others. You know, strengthen Mary and Kevin. Be with Jerry. Be with Tom and Kim as they go through these different things. Our, our hearts change. Our prayers change. Everything about us changes. Because the Lord doesn't do just a work in one part of our hearts. He does a work in every part. And sometimes we have to realize the part that he's working on for us and with us. <clears throat> and, he, and Paul brings this out to the church at Rome. They're a young church, but they're growing, they're maturing, and he's giving them uh, just doctrine. He's giving them examples. He's giving them hearts to just come after the things of the Lord. And he says in verse 3, For even Christ pleased not himself. He didn't come to please himself. And there's the example. You know, we go through this and we and we say, you know, this is the way that we should be and this is what we should be doing. And it's not a have to, but we get to because as we do it, we become more like Jesus. And that's our cry. Lord, I want to be more like you. Oh. <laughs> and being more like Jesus means we have less of self and more of him. And it, isn't that what we read in Scripture? He must increase and I must decrease. Not because it has to, but because that's the right way. And, and we always want the right way. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And that's from Psalm 69, uh, verses 9 and 10. Uh, and he says this there. Uh, he says, well, I'll start at verse 8. He says, well, verse 7. I could do the whole psalm, but <laughs> verse 7, because for your sake, so again, the Lord's speaking about somebody else's sake, for your sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien to my mother's children. Can you imagine that? Uh, a stranger in all the land. He should have been exalted. He should have been known for who he was. Even his own family didn't want to know him. He says, for the zeal of thine house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. In other words, I humbled myself completely down to absolutely nothing so that others could be strengthened and built up. Oh. And look at the end result. He goes to the cross to die for us, to show us that ultimate act of love, that ultimate way that Jesus had of why he came. He came to die. Oh, Lord, help us to be in that place where we're not clamoring to live and to get stuff, but to die so that others can see your goodness and your glory. Oh, when the church could rise up and do that, then this land would be healed, I think. This country would be strengthened, but the church can't do that. And if we can't do it for, for him, then what's the country going to do? It's going to see the example of Christianity that's wrong. You know, it doesn't mean that we're not brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean that we're not Christians, but we're weak. And the Lord wants to show the world strong Christians, strong Christianity in the midst. You know, oh, boy. This chapter was awful for me, sorry. <laughs> uh, he says in verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, uh, so that we could see that, that we through patience, there's that word that we hate, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Mm. Through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we could have hope, that we could endure to have hope. And, and we're going to have that enduring as we go through. We're going to have to endure the things of this life as we go through that we would have hope. And yet we're the only group of people in the whole world that have a sure hope. The rest of the world has, I hope so, we have a sure hope. 
that we're going home to heaven. And it's amazing that the faces uh, Thursday is as we're going through the, the funeral, just telling them the, the, the difference between believers and non-believers, the, the difference between having a relationship with Jesus and just knowing the name of Jesus in the faces that, that were in unbelief that you could really know Jesus. Oh, boy. <laughs> and and it, just, it, it just was great to have a hope in the midst of that when the rest really had no hope. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know where he is. We don't know what's going on. Too young. Yes, he was too young. But babies are too young that are getting killed in the womb. Baby Christians that never grow up, that are still sucking on a bottle, are too young to stay in that place. We need to grow in the things of grace and to know our Lord and to have that comfort of the Scriptures and have hope and not be whiny Christians that have no hope outside of what the world can give us. And yet the Lord shows us that we can have a hope that goes so far above the things that the world can give us. He says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, <laughs> one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Unity in the Holy Spirit, as he talks about it. He says, That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's amazing here that four times in this book we we talk about the mouth. Uh, go back to chapter 3 uh, and look at verse 14. When we start, first started out uh, in this chapter or in this book, uh, we, we were kind of beaten up with the first few chapters, uh, but chapter 3 especially, and it showed us what was going on with our mouth and with our, our lives. Uh, and it says this uh, in verse 14 of chapter 3. Remember, uh, talking about ourselves, that we're all gone out of the way. There's none that understand. There's none that are seeking after God. But in verse 14, it says, whose mouth, and these are the ones who are unbelievers. These are the ones who aren't walking in the things of the Lord, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. There we were. That's how we started. Our mouth was full of cursing and bitterness towards the things of the Lord. Drop down to verse 19 of the same chapter. And it says, Now we know what things soever uh, the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. So as we start in our walk with the Lord, as we start in our relationship with the Lord, we start out full of cursings and bitterness. We come to that place where the Lord stops our mouths from saying those things, from going on into those places. And now move on to chapter 10, the next mention of the mouth. Uh, uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 9 here, uh, and we see the difference that happens as we become believers, as we start walking in the things of the Lord, and there's a progression in this that's just so wonderful. We start out full of cursings and bitterness. Our mouths are stopped. In chapter 10, it, it says in verse 9, that if thou confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So the mouth opens again, but it opens this time in a place of coming to salvation. So we've gone from being having a mouth full of cursings and the mouth being stopped, and then we start confessing that Jesus is Lord. And didn't each one of us go through that as we came to salvation? First, we were full of cursings and bitterness and anger and hurt and frustration. Our mouths got stopped. And the Lord comes to us, and the next time he, he, he has our mouth, it's open to confess him as Lord and Savior. Oh, and how he takes us and how he moves us. And now he says in verse 6 in this chapter, in chapter 15, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. So we come in with other believers, and we have unity in the Holy Spirit. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. So we've gone this whole gamut of a whole life, just in a few chapters, just looking at the mouth, just going from one side of the spectrum all the way to the other side. And it's so sweet to see where the Lord has brought us, not half having to have any more cursings and bitterness, but now coming together and glorifying God together. 
And whoever thought, especially when you were younger, <laughs> that you'd be in a church on a Wednesday night reading scriptures. God, I'll never do that. God, those poor weak people, what's the matter with them? And yet here we are, <laughs> and we're the happiest we've ever been. And we get to be in the scriptures. And, and Paul just brings this out as he comes through the whole book uh, of where we've come from and where we're going to and what's going to happen. And he, and he points out the mature believers that are there just worshiping the Lord together with one heart, one mind, one mouth. Just how sweet the Lord has, has done a work in our hearts and our lives and he goes on in verse 7, and he says, Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And that's what we should be there for, to receive each other as Christ receives us, for God's glory. People come in, we receive them just as they are for God's glory. They come in hurting, bitter, angry, upset, come in looking for something different, and we get to show them God's glory in the midst of it. He says in verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So he talks again about the Jews and the Gentiles coming into that same place that were one in salvation. He's still working on that because remember they're in Rome. Uh, the Jews have been pretty much driven out, but a few have started going back in because of the change of the Caesars. Uh, and there's friction there. there. There's trouble there. But he says there shouldn't be that trouble. There shouldn't be that division. shouldn't be that division between black and white, between black and Hispanic. Shouldn't be that difference be between us and the Chinese, us and the Koreans. There shouldn't be that much difference with the culture differences. We're one in Christ. And when we get to heaven, all nations are going to be there. But we're going to have the heart of the Lord then too. And just be able to worship together in the midst of it. One Lord, one God, one Savior, one baptism, <laughs> one faith. And it's all for the glory of God. So he says, and then in verse 9, uh, and as we go from verses 9 to 12, we're going to see some uh, just what the Lord did in the Old Testament to bring this about. And he says in verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So we see in the midst of this, uh, verses 10, 11, and 12, we see quotes from Deuteronomy, from the Psalms, from Isaiah. So the Psalms, the law, and the prophets all come into that place of worshiping together, Gentiles and Jews together, all ye people. As he brings it about for, for the Jews that would be there, that even in your scriptures, it says that the Gentiles will be there. We need to receive them as Christ received them. We need to minister to them as Christ did. And here's a man who you, just a few years before was in that place that the, the, the Gentiles were those that were just there to be fuel for the fires of hell. You Gentile dogs. And the names that would come out of him for those people. And yet now he loves on them. And he just says, you're included in the kingdom as he brings them in and just rejoices over what God is doing. What a change of heart. But that's maturity that's going on in his life. And we really have to look at our own hearts and, Lord, where am I with this? Am I okay with them coming in? Am I okay seeing them worshiping the Lord just like we're worshiping? Lord, is, is it all right with my heart or is there issues in my heart about it? And if there is, Lord, you, you need to do something about it because I don't want to stay in this place. I want to worship you, Lord. And it's, and it's crazy the way the Lord works on those things, too. Uh, is he brings different people into our lives and different situations that, that he just checks your heart. Remember the first 
first time a, a guy uh, at one of the churches I was at came in uh, and he started talking with me. He was brought in by somebody else and, and the guy just put him next to me and said, here, take care of him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> and he was on his way to jail. And it was just like, okay, where's my heart in this? <laughs> Because you just take a step back, okay, what are you going to jail for? <laughs> if you killed somebody, please take ten steps back and, and let me work on this as I work up to you. But boy, just just the intensity of that, of those situations. And you go, oh man. And yet, when he got out of prison, I was one of the first ones that he called. I'm out. Wrote letters to me from, from prison. And he gets out and he challenged me. The first time that I sat with him, we were at a prayer meeting together, and he said, can I come to the prayer meeting? Well, of course you can come. You know, no question, no no, no doubt about it. Yeah, come on in. And after the prayer meeting, he said, well, how are you? How you doing? What's going on? What what'd you think? And he said, well, you, you guys prayed okay, but you guys don't have intensity like we do in prison. Said, what are you talking about? He said, you guys pray, but you're free. We're bound up and chained up. When we pray, it's intense, and it's straight to the point. You guys are so free, you, you have no limitation. We have so many limitations, but we want the Spirit of God to work. And, and so we're more desirous, and, and we just get in there and fight for it. You guys are just lazy. Laz laz what is it? Yeah, that's the word. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a word out there. <laughs> it's floating through my mind. We're almost lazy about it. I said, we're intense about it. Because where else are we going to go? When we have prayer meetings, they're two, three hours long because we got nowhere to go. <laughs> you, you guys have an hour limit. You know, you just, you sit down, you got an hour. <laughs> oh, that's it. You're done. And you're out again because you got a busy schedule. We have nowhere to go. So we just keep seeking God. Just, oh, the challenge of the heart. And, and it came from a place I didn't think it would come from. So, wow, Lord. But th that's what the Lord puts near us and to us so that we can see the different challenges that are there for different people and the different things that are going on and the different ways that they look at things. And, boy, it challenges our heart sometimes, doesn't it? That, Lord, I don't have that. How come I don't have that and they do? And, and I should be the strong one. And yet I'm the weak one in this. But Lord, you send them alongside to challenge and to encourage to go the right direction. <laughs> Amazing stuff that the Lord can do that we have no idea is going on. Uh, so in, in that place, he, he comes in from, from the Psalms, from the law, from the prophets, just saying that these should be in there. So how are you going to receive them? If God is saying it, then, then why aren't your hearts in that place to do it? And either we're not reading the scriptures and not letting them challenge our hearts, or we're, we're just doing our daily reading program so that we can get through the chapters and mark them off, and they don't really do anything with our hearts. Lord, what are you doing in my heart with it? And just look at the challenge that's here. He says, what are you going to do with these things? My word says so, so what are you going to do with it? Oh, my word says that I want you to change, that I want you to be different. I want you to grow in grace. And in the knowledge of who I am, and we go, Lord, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't know who you are in this. And he says, good, let me challenge you in it then. And let me take you to a, a deeper level, a deeper walk. Let me take something away from you so that you can see how your heart can be challenged in that. And how are you going to deal with it? Oh, and I remember one gal, which is the reason we first started going to one of the churches that we went to, uh, we were there one Sunday just to check out the church because we wanted something close and we wanted something that was in the city. And we got there. And the next Sunday, we go there and everybody's crying except for her and her husband. They were going around to everybody just quoting scriptures to them, telling them what the Lord had taken them through in the scriptures that he had given them to get there. Because the night before, their son got killed by a robber. He came out of the house, his wife is sitting next to him, the baby's in the back seat in the car seat, and the guy comes out, blows him away with a shotgun. And mom and dad are there quoting scriptures of what the Lord took them through all night long because they didn't sleep, but the scriptures that the Lord were giving them to hold them up, to strengthen them. It's just like, okay, this is a good place to be. <laughs> 
if they can do that, Lord, you got to take me there. But I don't want to go through that to get there. <laughs> Let me go through something else to get there. But boy, the things that he's going to take us through, and nothing happens by accident. These things come so that he can minister to our hearts in the midst of it. And he brings us through, and he tells the church there, the law, the Psalms, the prophets are saying all these things. And what are your hearts going to do with it, you church at Rome? What are you going to do with it, you mature believers? How are you going to react to it? And then he says in verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy. Not just some, but all joy. May Look at what he, he brings to the church and he says to them, I want you to have all joy. Not just a little bit. Not just when you're happy. I want you to have joy even when you're miserable. <laughs> oh, Lord. All joy and peace and believing. And that's the way it comes to us. We believe that God can do it. Lord, I believe you can do it. Please bring that joy to me, Lord. That you may abound in hope. He brings us that so that we can have hope. He's been talking about faith He's been talking about believing, and now now he comes in and he says, this is the hope that you need to have. This is the sure hope that you can have, that you can have joy and peace in the midst of everything, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You can't do it on your own. You can't work it up. You, You can't read enough to get there. You can't be in church enough to get there. It's going to be the Holy Spirit bringing it to you and instilling that in us, but it, us it being those willing vessels for him to pour it out into as he pours out of himself to give to us. And he says in verse 14, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness and filled with all knowledge, and that you're able also to admonish one another. <laughs> uh, just... Uh, amazing here as he speaks to the church and verses 14 and 15 really go together and he says nevertheless brethren i have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of god as he said i'm persuaded of you my my brethren my my church body that, that i'm writing to that you are full of goodness you're filled with knowledge And you're also able to admonish one another. Look at the order. First, you're filled with the goodness of God. You know his goodness. You know his kindness. You come to salvation. You get filled up with who he was. Then you get filled up with the knowledge of who he is. You you start growing in grace. And then you're able to admonish one another. And the church sometimes has it backwards because we want the gift of admonishing one another without having goodness, <laughs> without without having knowledge of who God is, we just want to admonish one another. We're just like, oh, we need that right order. First, we need to be filled with him, the knowledge of who he is, filled with his goodness and his grace, and then be able to encourage each other and admonish one another. And what does he say in other places? That we do it in love. And you can't do it in love without knowing love. And so the order there is so wonderful, full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, so that then we could admonish one another. Because we always need admonishing, don't we? Even the scriptures, which we know are given by God, are there for our working, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for all those things. But first, we have to have that love. We have to understand that love, that goodness that God has, and then the knowledge of who he is and be able to admonish one another then. But in that place, it's not how much we know, but how well we know the one who's given it. Not how much of the scriptures we know, because there's a lot of people that know a lot of scriptures. The devil knows the word, but he uses it the wrong way and for the wrong purposes. We want to know the scriptures but to use them in the right way. But that means we need to know the one that's given them, not just to know the scriptures so that we can beat on each other. And isn't it amazing? The cults know the scriptures, but they know how to twist them and to use them in the wrong way. They're not filled with goodness and filled with the knowledge of who God is. They're filled with themselves and how much they can get out of it. We want to be filled with God's goodness 
filled up with the knowledge of who he is, and then be able to do those things and to come into those places that we need to. And then he says in verse 16 uh, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Paul was the, the apostle to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Spirit has sanctified this giving of the Gentiles to come into the church, then who is the church to say that they can't come in? Oh. <laughs> we start limiting because we, we want it our way instead of God's way. Oh. And just think, if the Jews had read their Bibles, the parts that they had for themselves... Even just the first first five books, because remember in Deuteronomy, we had that quote from Deuteronomy about the Gentiles coming in. Even if they had read their scriptures, what they could have done with the world. And just the same for you and I. Oh, what we could have done if we knew the author of the scriptures and were filled up with him in the Holy Spirit. Oh. And he says in verse 17, I have therefore whereof... Uh, I pray glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by, uh, excuse me, hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and by deeds. So he's putting them, himself on the line, saying it, it's the word of God coming through, and I'm being obedient in the midst of it in my actions. Because where the word comes, then action needs to follow for us to really have it in our lives and working through our lives. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about until Illyricum, uh, the pronunciation is awful in, in, in the Greek. Uh, it's I-L and then L-O-O, Illu. <laughs> It's amazing, and it doesn't really mean anything. So it's only mentioned once in Scripture. There you go. You got it. Uh, so I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. He went where nobody was. He didn't go to take over a big church. <laughs> Just so that he could have a big church, he went where nobody was and started out with nothing. Because that's the gift that God had given him to do. And that's just so wonderful. He didn't want to build on anybody else's foundation. He wanted God's foundation to start it out. And sometimes that's so much better. But as it is written, uh, and this is from Isaiah again, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Uh, so he brings this into play as this is why I came and this is what's going on. And he says in verse 22, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, <laughs> but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey. Paul wanted to get to this church. He was going to get there, but not the way that he thought he was going to go. Because remember, he was bound up in, in, in that ship uh, as, as he was brought down to Rome uh, and had that encounter in Acts, but was brought to Rome but a, as a prisoner instead of on his own free will. Uh, I might be brought on my way hither to, thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go into Jerusalem. Remember, he had the offering that was going to Jerusalem because they were in famine, they were struggling, they were without work, without jobs because they were Christians. They were suffering, so they took up a collection uh, in Macedonia and Achaia, and they were going to bring it to him. He says, but now I have to go to Jerusalem first to minister to the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Hmm. 
and we read about that, we look at that, and we realize that sometimes those carnal things have to be there. The spiritual things come first as the Holy Spirit puts them in this place. Uh, those spiritual things come first ministering to them, and the carnal things second. When therefore I have performed this, in verse 28, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain, wanting to get through into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers for me. And he's going to list three things that he wants them to pray about. But this word strive uh, that he has there is really a passionate word. Uh, it, it comes from the word that we get for our word agonize. Agonize in prayer for me. Be in prayer for me. And how often do we really agonize in prayer for the things of the Lord to come into our own lives, much less for other people? We might mention it in passing. Oh, Lord, by the way, <laughs> bless this, do that. But to agonize in those things, to have a passion about it. But he says, these are the prayers that I want you to have in verses 31 and 32. He says, that I may be delivered from them who do not believe in Judea. <laughs> that he could be delivered from those people. The second thing uh, is that, and that my service, which I have uh, for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that it might come, that it would be a blessing for them, that it would be in that place where it would, they would realize that it was a service that God was bringing to them, that it was something that he had done because God had given him that, that opportunity and that privilege to do it. And then the third thing in verse 32, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. This is my heart. I want to minister in these areas, and I want the Lord to bless it. But notice he says that I may come to you by the will of God. I want God's will in it, because if I come without God's will in it, it's, it's going to bear no fruit. Lord, I, I want your will to be done in this. So, Lord, help me to go in the power of your might, for your purposes, by your will. Oh, and then he finishes up this chapter, and, and he says, Now the God of peace be with you all. As he ministers to them, you think that's the end of the book, right? Because he says, Now the peace of God be with you, amen. Takes him a whole other chapter before he finally signs off. <laughs> that's just like Paul. It's a good pastor. You know, This is my last point. Well, it was my last point, but now I got another point. <laughs> you just keep going because God just keeps pouring out. But the peace of God be with you. The peace of God and the peace with God be with you. And he ministers to the church that he hasn't seen, but he's grown to love because he's heard of them. He's seen what's going on with them. He sees the things that are happening there. And he just rejoices over them, and he just wants to see them so badly and just to encourage them and to be with them. And, boy, for our hearts to be in that place. And certainly a challenging chapter, a challenging chapter for us to realize where are we with you, Lord, and what are you doing in my life? And, Lord, am I acting like you want me to? And if I'm not, Lord, then bring me to that place. Oh, in such a heart for the people that God has given because didn't Jesus come with that same heart for the people and he came and he died for you and I and we get to celebrate communion tonight just so so wonderful to be able to come uh, in these times and do that uh, so father as we come uh, Lord may you minister to our hearts just speak to us Lord about the things that you have for us uh, just encourage us in those things Lord if there's things that that are there that that you desire to change in us, Father, then please have your way. But, Lord, as, as we sit before you during this time, may we be still before you and just know your heart, know your ways, and just ask you, Lord, to speak to us about the things that you desire for us. And, Father, we just want you to speak, whether it's correction, whether it's instruction, whether it's admonition. Lord, 
whatever it is, we just want you to speak because we want to be hearers. We want to be those that listen to what you say. So have your way with us, Father. We love you. We thank you. And we just ask that you'd minister to us in the midst, Lord, as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we're thankful that you came, that you sent your only begotten Son to come into this world, to be born of a virgin, to grow up, to minister, to die on the cross, and then rise again from the dead, Lord. Just such an amazing thing that you've done for us, Lord. We can't even fathom the depths of that, can't even fathom why you would even do that, Lord, because we're we're run by our emotions, we're run by our our self-preservation, and yet, Lord, you came not to preserve yourself, but to give yourself. So, Father, uh, may we start learning more about your heart, your ways, to acknowledge you in them, Lord, and to just bring glory to you. So help us with that, Father. We, We hold in our hands these elements, Lord, these things that remind us of what you've done, the bread just representing your body being broken for us, the cup representing your blood that was poured out, just reminding us over and over how much we need your covering. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no taking away of sin. And Father, we we see these sinful beings that we are, especially going back to chapter 3 in Romans tonight, Lord, just uh, there was none that sought you, none that followed after you, including us. And yet, Lord, because of your great love, you continued to draw and you continued to ask and you continued to knock until we responded. And we're so thankful that you did, Lord. But Father, again, we don't know that kind of heart. We're not that long-suffering. We're not that gracious. And yet, Lord, do you want to change us into that? So help us with it, Father, that we might know you better, that we might be filled with your goodness and filled with the knowledge of who you are before we go out and do anything. So we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you, and we just give thanks to you now in Jesus' name. Let's partake. 